Our next speaker uh, is a true entrepreneur and uh, a very successful um, head of a private equity company. Uh, Tom Kennedy is the founder and CEO of Kensington Capital. And Kensington Capital is one of Canada's largest private equity firms. And Tom is uh, an engineer. And as you may know, engineering is art grounded in, in science. And Tom uh, brings uh, over 30 years plus of um, uh, experience as an engineer and more importantly as an entrepreneur and as an investor in private equity. Started uh, Kensington Capital in 1995. It has grown significantly and Kensington Capital is involved in three areas in private equity. And over the last uh, 18 and a half years, uh, they've looked at probably 3,000 or more uh, potential acquisitions, made 98, uh, sold 28 successfully, or sorry, sold 68, I guess, um, and, and have uh, actually got to add up now, 28 left, but uh, an enviable record, about a 32% internal rate of return, typical holding period of four to seven years uh, with two and a half to four and a half times uh, return on equity. Uh, so superb performance. But Tom also recognized the importance increasingly of the alternative asset uh, space. And Kensington Capital also has uh, a hedge fund that is very ably managed and is involved in power and infrastructure. And as John Nicola illustrated yesterday, Nicola Wealth Management's investment strategy has probably around 50 to 60 percent of their assets uh, in uh, alternative asset classes. And that's also indicative of Tiger 21 members. So Tom is here to educate us on uh, different asset classes. Tom? Thank you, Norm. I'm going to be very quick because I think we've been sitting a lot today. And I'm going to ask if you have questions, just ask them as I go. I'll try and keep an eye open and, and uh, watch. What I'd like to spend a bit of time on is uh, why you want in uh, to include alternative assets in your portfolio. The main, the main thing that uh, is an issue for most people is trying to figure out why and how to invest in alternatives. The point that I think everybody in this room needs to be aware of is if you're not offering alternatives to your clients, somebody else is. Wealthy people were, were uh, big investors in alternatives at the outset of this as an asset class 30 or 40 years ago and have continued to grow. You can see the uh, institutional move into alternatives has been pretty significant. But look at the ultra high net worth with 60% alternatives. As, as Norm mentioned, uh, John yesterday was heading in that direction with his portfolios. So if you're not offering that as part of your package, your customers are getting it somewhere, somewhere else. The reason you put alternatives in your, in your portfolio is, is really three things. One is stability, second one is growth, third one is cash flow. We bought a hedge fund company about three years ago, um, mainly for that first point. We want the stability of being able to take advantage of the volatility in the public markets. Our hedge fund program is aimed at being uh, very untouched or uncorrelated by the public markets. It's got about a 0.3% correlation with public markets. And it, it generates about 1% a month of income. The growth comes from equities. Um, you know, you buy public equities to grow your capital, you buy private equities for the same reason. I'll give you an interesting statistic. There's about $60 trillion in the public markets worldwide, meaning that there's about $60 trillion worth of public stocks, about $60 trillion worth of all of our money invested in those stocks. In the private equity business, there's about $3 trillion right now. The private equity market is four times the size of the public equity market. That's one of the reasons that I like it. It is absolutely a buyer's market. It'll be a buyer's market for all of our lives and all of our clients' children's lives. So it's, it's a place where you can get better returns and better growth of capital than the public market. The third one is cash flow. Uh, Norm mentioned that we started an infrastructure business a few years ago. We invest in power projects. That gives us long-term 20 to 30 year 
uh, inflation protected cash flow with returns in the high single, low double digit range. So if you're interested in, in finding something for your clients that gives you long-term inflation protected cash flow and it, it runs in the 9, 10, 11% range, um, most infrastructure projects are able to generate that kind of return. Once again, wealthy people are, in, are big investors in alternatives and if you're not offering it, they're getting it somewhere else. The, the portfolio on the right is, uh, is pulled out of the Tiger 21 numbers. But you can see the difference between what most people are investing in that have a lot of wealth, and certainly all institutions are investing in, compared to a traditional stock and bond portfolio. Here's the way we try to think about it. This is just for our own portfolios within the firm. Of course, we're not saying get out of the public markets. That's a key element. It provides liquidity for your portfolio. And, and you should have some, some number. It depends on, on uh, your liquidity requirements in every case. Private equity, as I mentioned, is an addition to, the, to your stock portfolio. It simply extends the amount of equities you're buying. So if you're thinking of having 50% stocks, 50% bonds, for example, uh, you might add private equity to that. You might add infrastructure, which is, is a, an extension of what I would consider my bond portfolio. I buy debt instruments for income. I don't buy debt for growth. I buy infrastructure for income, exactly the same reason. Hedge funds we buy in order to, to capture the volatility in the market. And we're all aware of the extreme volatility that we've been going through in the last several years. We don't expect that to stop. Hedge funds take advantage of that and give us an opportunity to stabilize portfolios. So this is what a modern portfolio should look like in our view, something like 25 to 30% in the public markets, the rest in alternatives. As I said before, if you're not offering that, your customers are getting it somewhere. So if you want a bigger share of wallet, bring those alternatives to the table. There's lots of ways to invest in them. There's lots of managers. Uh, there's lots of capital being raised at any point in time. But you have to be a little bit careful about how. One of the things that's very appealing about alternatives is tax. The private equity business in Canada, as we're all aware, you can get $850,000 tax free in your capital gains in a Canadian controlled private corporation. We saw some structures the other day about using uh, family trusts. Um, you know, I, certainly everybody in my family has used up their capital gains exemption. I haven't been able to figure out a way of getting the dog into that yet, but we're working on it. Um, I think. Having the ability to capture and utilize that capital gains exemption is ideal. The other thing is capital gains are a lot lower tax rate than any other form of income. Tax deferral is, is an outstanding aspect of, of most uh, infrastructure investments. In both Canada and the United States, we have a thing called capital cost allowance. I was talking to some gentlemen the other night. Our infrastructure business generates cash flow that for a probably, in Canada, it's about 10 or 12 years, maybe a little bit longer, of tax-free income at about 10%. In the United States, the tax laws are a little bit different. The utilization of CCA is a little bit different. It's about eight and a half years of tax-free income. So think about that. And how can you use that in a portfolio? If you're investing in master limited partnerships in the United States, you know all about recapture. We don't have recapture in this. This is just capital cost allowance. It's been sitting around and being used by heavy capital intensive industries all over the world since the beginning of, of taxation. But use your expert resources on how, how to take advantage of these different tax treatments. They're quite different than public securities. Other things you need to be aware of are gating. I was answering an email this morning from a fellow at Guardian who's pretty annoyed at a, at a hedge fund that he's invested in. He tried to withdraw $2 million and they let him take $250,000 out. Well, gating is a big issue. Hedge funds are able to raise a lot of money because they claim they're liquid, and they are liquid until they don't want to give your money back. So understand what the gating rules are. Understand what your secondary market options are. Um, it's an ugly market. The secondary market for private assets, if you're a neophyte, will get you killed. Uh, in 2009, we were buying private equity fund investments at about 40 and 50 cents on the dollar. 
Uh, Harvard tried to move a billion and a half dollars worth of their private equity portfolio, and they got bids at 25 cents. So it can be an ugly marketplace. If you understand it and find people that can help you move assets in the secondary market, you should. And we've consistently, over the last 17 years, never suffered a discount more than about 10% from our net asset value. Understand redemption terms. Every fund, every type of investment you make in the alternative sector is quite different than mutual funds or other public market products. And understand risk. This is a study that you can download. The um, name of it's down at the bottom, and I think you're going to circulate the slides afterwards. Um, if you're investing in a single private company, the probability of loss is 42%. The probability of losing all of your money is 30%. So as Barbara was mentioning, when most entrepreneurs sell their business, the first thing they do is go out and buy some other business. And I've certainly seen that many times myself. They lose their money because they don't know what they're doing. Investing in a fund will give you some diversification because a typical private equity fund has five or 10 investments in it. And investing in a portfolio of funds will just about take the loss off the table. So understand where you are on that curve. So when you're putting your client into private equity, you're putting them into the right instruments. Be aware of manager risk. Um, this fellow was promising 10% returns. He's now serving a long time. Um, manager risk is very significant. We probably spend six months to a year assessing a manager before we'll invest with them. Uh, when Onyx raised their first mid-market fund, Oncap, Jerry Schwartz phoned, been an investor with Jerry for years, wanted us to put some money into Oncap as one of their lead investors, and he hadn't hired the staff yet. So I said, well, you know, hire the staff and we'll talk to them. We'll figure out if we want to back them. We let the first fund go by. Six years later, we invested in their third or second fund, and this year we've invested in their third fund. We're very happy with that. We missed some returns because their first fund was successful, but I didn't want to back a blank team. I don't know the names. I don't know who's going to be doing the work. Get to know the people. Understand the liquidity in the investment that you're making. Um, you know, the velocity of capital is very important. We have an investment in, uh, in a fund in, in Quebec called Novacap, who typically hold investments for 12 to 15 years. We know a lot of their investors are annoyed with that, and we've been able to buy some secondary positions from them. But if you don't know what the game plan is on the way in, if you just look at it and say, this is a good private equity fund, you won't know what to, uh, what to explain to your, your own clients. Third thing is due diligence. The due diligence on a private equity fund, on an on a infrastructure project, on a hedge fund is complicated. Um, I think Barbara mentioned Tiger 21. There's a four-page document on, uh, on questions for investment managers. We, our due diligence questionnaire for a private equity fund manager is 150 pages long. We put four people in their office for three months understanding all of their accounting practices. We go through every single investment they've ever made. We understand who did what, how, do they, how did they create the value. That's hard due diligence. But don't, don't think you can just buy this stuff. Communication. We've, we've seen through uh, investment advisors an awful lot of misunderstanding of these types of assets. On the other hand, we've seen some very good practices. And the best practices we've seen are asking us to do the work. Where we're going in once a quarter, once a, every six months, whatever their time frame is. We're meeting with them. We're making sure that all of their questions are answered so they're the expert in front of their own clients. We create specialized reports for most of the top investors we have. We've got one IA whose team has about $50 million with us. I report to them every Friday at 2 o'clock. It's a personal phone call. Spend 20 minutes answering any questions he has. We prepare customized reports for his team that are tied into their software that goes right out to their clients with their letterhead. So they're, they're uh, whatever you call that, white labeling our stuff, or we're white labeling their stuff. But the private equity, the hedge fund, and the infrastructure reporting is done by us, so it looks like it comes from them. And they understand it before it goes out. You have to be the expert, and that onus to make you the expert has to be on the fund manager. 
So in conclusion, if you want a greater share of wallet, you got to offer alternatives. If you're going to offer alternatives, um, my advice is don't try this at home. Find some expertise that you can count on, that can work with you, that isn't going to steal your book of business from you, and that really is good at the business. And work with those managers or that manager to build a private equity, an infrastructure, and a hedge fund pro program that works within your portfolios. That's it for me. Can we open it Thank up you. for questions? Might add, we too have a, have a white paper. This one was not sponsored by Credit Suisse because they're a competitor. This one was sponsored by ourselves. And I've got copies of it here, and I think Sean is able to send electronic copies if you want. But it's, it's a document that was written to allow you to read about alternatives. It's also user-friendly enough that you can certainly give it to clients, and it will allow them to understand why it should be part of their portfolio. So I have one question for you, Tom, that if you were an advisor looking to get into the alternative uh, asset class space, what would be the, 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 the first step and, and the progression of steps to do that? I think the first step would be to start reading. It's, it's a, um, there, there's a lot of literature on this that's, that's worthwhile reading. And understand it so that when you sit down with somebody like myself or others that are managers in this space, um, you're not just taking what I say at face value. You've actually got a bit of knowledge before you start. And it, you know, it, it's a day or two of work to do that reading, but boy, is it worthwhile. We're approved on most Could of the banks. You repeat bank the question, sorry. Yeah, the question is, are bank-owned uh, brokerage firms able to own our, our products? And I presume you mean generally anybody else's products, too. We're, we're approved on most of the bank's platforms, so we're, in a, we're an acceptable supplier of, of uh, these products. Um, and many alternative asset managers are becoming approved. So have they come in and done the due diligence That's right. That's right. We had, uh, I mean, we had Royal Bank doing due diligence on us for a couple of months. They had two guys in our office for quite a bit of time. Uh, most of the banks have a team that does that, and they're pretty good. Yeah. Is that the same in the States? So the question is, is that the same in the States? Good uh, we, we have, we're not familiar with very many bank-owned dealers in the States. So we're, Just regular brokerage. Yeah. yeah. Right, so the regular broker dealers in the states that have looked at us have certainly done some due diligence. I wouldn't want to say that they've done very good due diligence, but. I would encourage you, uh, if you're in the US and interested, to connect Tom with your broker dealer because this is a, a, a real opportunity, but especially in, for those of you who are in the pre-retirement and retirement market and are looking for income or yield because in the power infrastructure, you're looking at the potential for a 10% after-tax return. Ryan? Can you speak a little bit more to the infrastructure investments? Yeah, yep. you speak um, to the infrastructure successes? Investments? Yeah. We, we have spent a lot of time uh, looking at this space because it's a big capital demand space, and it's traditionally been funded by governments. We're not aware of any governments that have any money at the moment, so we thought there's a great opportunity to, for, for <laughs> private investing. Um, we looked at a lot of different infrastructure type projects, and you know, infrastructure, like anything, it can be defined as broadly as you want, but there have been a lot of projects like ring roads, um, bridges, things like that that have been invested in by infrastructure funds and many of them have not worked out very well as investments. There are some exceptions. The PEI bridge has been a good one. The 407 is an outstanding investment. So, you know, it's, it's a space where you need to be thoughtful about where you're going. What we've settled on is the power business. And the reason is there's about two and a half trillion dollars that needs to be spent in the next 10 years in North America just to bring our power systems up to the point where we have the same power in 10 years time as we have now. Power demand keeps growing. I think we've seen enough pictures on how many electronic devices we all have. 
electricity demand is growing. Both population and, and each individual in the, in the populace is using more. So those are trends we really like in any investment. Um, there's a huge amount of capital demand there. So what we're focusing on is power uh, generation plants, uh, power transmission, and, and uh, the step down within cities. We've, uh, I'll give you an example. We, we're closing probably Tuesday of next week, a $40 million acquisition of a, a waste heat generation plant. It sits on the back of a TransCanada pipeline compressor station. When you compress natural gas, it gives off heat. That heat is captured, it's turned into, run through a heat exchanger and turned into electricity and sold into the grid. We have a 22-year contract with BC Hydro to buy the power. It's a take-or-pay contract. It's got a full inflation protection. Uh, so we're looking there at about an 11% rate of return over a 22-year period. And it, you know, it'll be whatever it is at the end of 22 years, 17% or something. During that time, the investor gets the capital back over 22 years, just a straight line amortization of capital. Plus, you'll make about 10% on your investment paid quarterly. Um, so, you know, your yield at the end of 22 years is going to be infinite because your capital is all back and you're still getting the, the uh, payments for the electricity. But those are, there's many, many projects like that. We've got five power plants up in the Peace River District, all on gas compressor stations. We're working on a pumped hydro system down near San Diego that's uh, using wind power to pump water uphill at night and then uh, using the gravity to generate to run a generator in the daytime. Uh, there's a big gas-fired power plant that we're installing south of Calgary. There's a lot of, lot of opportunity. Thomas? The question is, what's the minimum investment size? Uh, we don't, I don't personally believe in minimums. So in our institutional funds, it's five million. In the uh, funds we've set up for individuals, I, I think we have a $5,000 minimum. There is no legal minimum. It's just accredited investor tests in both countries. Tom, thank you. Thank you.